Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Joe Brewer, and I'm going to be uh, your host and facilitator today as we're going to talk about cultural scaffolding and regenerative economics. I'm really excited to have you all here today. This is the 10th webinar that we've done for the Earth Regenerator Study Group. For those of you who haven't uh, joined the study group, you can see a little button at the bottom that says uh, join the study group if you'd like to join us at some point. It's all completely free. These webinars and the study group are offered in the spirit of the gift economy because this work just feels so important to, uh, to share freely and openly with everyone. And also for those of you who uh, have friends that might be interested in this webinar afterwards, just send them to this same link and they can come and watch the replay anytime afterwards. The replay becomes available within about five minutes after the session is over. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be talking about how to create social supports to help us make life transitions. And um, I'd love to uh, invite you, as Diego is so beautifully role modeling, to say hello and, uh, and introduce yourself in the chat box on the side, uh, in the sidebar, which is a great place to have parallel conversations. In all of our previous webinars, there's been a lot of activity in the chat boxes with people sharing links and having side conversations. And I think a lot of learning happens there. So please use that chat box as much as you'd like um, to connect with friends, to share ideas, and to participate in the discussion. The general format of these webinars is that I'm going to give about a 30 minute long presentation, which uh, will be about the topic that we're discussing today of cultural scaffolding for regenerative economics. And uh, then we will finish the presentation part. And this is a beautiful thing about Crowdcast is that we're able to then have pretty dynamic discussions using um, a question and answer tool and inviting people into video uh, screen, like screen sharing to have conversations. And so what I wanna say is that, uh, our invitation to all of you is during the presentation portion of the session, if at any time you have a question you'd like to ask or a topic you'd like to discuss, just go to the, the, the text at the bottom of the screen that says, ask a question. And from there, you can type in a question or a topic you'd like to discuss. Or you can also vote for the questions that other people have asked. Now, during the presentation portion, I won't see those questions. But as soon as the presentation is over, we will use the questions and topics that get the most votes to, in order to invite discussion. And um, the people who ask the questions are invited into a video, like a face-to-face -face video conference to come on screen and join the conversation with me so that we can discuss that topic or that question in more depth. We found that these webinars tended to go for about two hours. So we're starting now, it's 1 p.m. Central in the United States. That's also 1 p.m. where I am in Colombia. And uh, we'll go until about 3 p.m. Central Time. So I want to welcome you all and say it's just lovely to have you here. The topic we're going to discuss today is something that has impacted my life in a very profound way. As my wife and I, um, her name is Jessica, as we have tried to live our values as much as we could, but kept finding that there were just tremendous obstacles, mismatches, and lack of support for living the way that we felt is necessary as we lived within a, a society that was just structured very differently. And so, um, oh, I see Diego saying that the video is interrupting for him. If others are having this problem, please let me know. Uh, looks like people are having problems. Then just in a moment, uh, excuse me for a second, I'll refresh my screen and sometimes that addresses the problem. So let me try that. I'll be right back and hopefully the video will work for us when I return. All right, I'm back. Is the video feed working better for everyone? Let me know if it's working better now or not. So um, yeah, I've uh, just refreshed the screen. So if you could chat in the chat box and let me know if it's working better, please do. Um, I'd like to know if this intervention of refreshing the screen actually worked. 
Um, so if people could share comments in the chat box, please let me know. Um, in the meantime, though, I'd like to get started in the presentation, but I want to wait until I have some text feedback that the uh, that the feed is coming through before I go into that screen where I can't see the chat box. So if anyone could let me know if you're able to see me and if the connection is working, that would really help. So, um, but I'm not getting the feedback, which makes me worry that you're not seeing me. Let's see here. Um, so I'd really like to know, is the is still not working? Looks like Jeff is still having a problem. So I don't know if this video feed is working for people, um, but it looks like people are still having technical issues, which could be that the internet connection is weak on my end. I don't know. Um, so I hope that's not a problem for us to continue. But uh, I'd really like to start the presentation portion, and I hope that it works. So um, I'm not. I'm kind of at this impasse of whether I should continue or not if the problem's on my end. But I think for the sake of continuity and flow, I'm gonna go ahead and go into presentation mode and just hope for the best. So if people aren't able to hear me, I'll, I'll post that here too. Um, So I just posted a question in the chat box, hoping it's working well. All right, so it looks like I've got two people who are saying it's working okay. So I will use that as a cue to continue and we'll just see if it works. So um, yeah, what I wanna do now is start to share screen and it looks like everyone's having problems with the tech, with the technology. This isn't good. Um, I'm not sure what to do except to just continue and hope for the hope that it improves because I don't have any ability to do other things with the internet connection. Um, but let me, uh, let me just try for the best because I don't wanna to delay too long and I don't have anything I can do to help it anyway. So I'm just going to, to start the presentation and we'll see how it goes. And for everyone who's having trouble, maybe just uh, try refreshing your screen and see if that works for you. That uh, may be a problem on your end as well. Although by the pattern of so many people having troubles, it could be my connection. So um, either way, I'm gonna just go forward with the presentation because there's nothing else that I can do. And I hope that it improves. Okay, well, I'm in presentation mode. And I'm just hoping that it'll continue working and that the internet connection gets better. It seems like we're having internet connection problems, um, which is probably on my end, which is really unfortunate, and I'm sorry about that. But I wanna go ahead with the presentation um, without knowing if this is going to work. The topic we're going to discuss today is cultural scaffolding for regenerative economics. And as this picture shows, the real focus here is on how can we help each other to do what we can't easily do on our own. And that's really what this webinar is about today. And so um, the way that I wanna have this discussion is to talk about a, a framework called cultural scaffolding that has been really useful for helping me make better sense of how I can get the help that I need and how to help others who are following in similar footsteps to where we're going. Um, and I wanna start this off by asking a question that I think everyone can relate to. Why is it so hard to make good ecological choices? Why is it that even when our values are very clear to us, when we look around at our options, there are a lot of compromises, obstacles, and barriers that make it feel like even if we do something environmental and say our consumer purchases, that we still end up with problems in other ways like how we have to get around using transportation or um, how we need to interact with our family members who don't share the same ecological values that we do. And so we end up with a lot of situations where our choices are compromised and we're not able to really live regeneratively even though we do the best that we can. And I think this is a really big problem and something that we need to address directly if we're gonna start to 
do regenerative work in any kind of coherent and consistent way. And the way I want to describe this is using a, uh, an animated graphic that I want you to watch where both of these arrows are pointing and notice what happens when a real snowflake is forming. One thing you can see is that as parts of the snowflake that already have existing branches that actually the ice accumulates on the tips and they continue to grow. They grow on the structure that was already there. But in the gaps between these structures and the places in between, there's an absence of support. And actually thermodynamically, the freezing of the water to make ice releases heat. And so it's a little bit hotter in these deprivation zones, which means that it's impossible for ice to form there. And what I want to suggest here is that living regeneratively is like moving away from these branching support structures of regular life and moving into places where there's something like a hostility or at least a countervailing direction that makes it extra difficult to do things in the spaces in between. And that this pattern of using pre-existing structures to build upon to do new things is what we're talking about with scaffolding. And so this image for me, I think, is a really important way of thinking about how we're living in these voids in between when we don't have support structures and the structures themselves are growing in a direction that we don't want to go. So if we lean on those structures to help us make decisions, it takes us away from our goals and makes us less regenerative, which I think is a really big challenge for us as we try to make life decisions together. Now, really quickly, I'm just going to exit presentation mode and see if people are still having problems with the, with the screen sharing because it seems like people are... Looks like people are refreshing and it's helping them. So hopefully that'll work with other people too. Um, so I see people are having problems and I actually don't have the ability to reset my Wi-Fi. If that's something that um, uh, that people are suggesting, I think I'm going to just continue and, like I said, hope for the best. Um, so I'll jump back into the presentation now and continue and just say um, sorry about the technical difficulties. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. If we think about scaffolding in terms of architecture, it's a support structure that's used to help the development, you know, the continued building of that constructed edifice and that the building could not be constructed without these support structures, but then it doesn't need them later on. And this is the key insight for us, that most of us lack the supports to develop in the direction we need to go, so we're not able to live regeneratively. And if we leave the scaffolds of an extractive society, we find ourselves deprived of support, and life becomes much more difficult. And this is why there's so many um, barriers and obstacles and why it feels so heroic to live regeneratively because of the sacrifices that need to be made. And this slows down the progress of adopting regenerative practices. So it's something we desperately need to address if we're going to increase the number of people living regeneratively. So basically, here's what I wanna talk about in today's webinar is that there's this gap between why it's so difficult to live regeneratively and if some of us are able to do it, how can we help others to live regeneratively? And what I wanna do is offer a structural theory from the science of cultural evolution that I think can bring some essential clarity for us about how to bridge this gap between where we are as we try to live this way and what we can do to both live this way better and help others to do so at the same time. And so, that's what we're going to talk about now with cultural and, and the scaffolding theory. And it basically works like this. If you think about childhood development, where you start with a newborn baby, or even during the time of prenatal care, when the baby is still in the mother's womb, that there's so much support that's needed to help the child learn and grow. So when they're a small baby, they need the mother to nurse them with, with breast milk. Um, they can't walk on their own, and eventually they get to the point where they learn how to walk by holding the hands of an adult, and so on. There are various kinds of structural support that are age and development appropriate. 
So at each stage of development, there are ways that we support their development to grow into adults. And this is physical and athletic, like helping them to walk, but also social and emotional, like teaching them language, helping them manage their emotions, giving them key concepts and providing them with tools and role modeling of how to behave in society. So every step of the way, they're receiving these social forms of scaffolding and structural support that help children to learn and grow across their lifespans. And this is what is called cultural scaffolding. More specifically, cultural scaffolding is all of the interactions that generate beneficial outcomes that occur between actors, artifacts, practices, and the structured environment or, art or infrastructure. So if you think about this example where there's a teacher here that is in the infrastructure of a classroom using artifacts like chalk and the chalkboard, and they're engaging in practices like learning arithmetic or how to add and subtract or multiply and divide, that when they have these various social patterns in their environment, it helps them to learn mathematics more easily. And all of these things together provide cultural scaffolding for the learning process. So we can provide cultural scaffolding by being a particular kind of actor or participant in an environment, by using or introducing or designing and creating artifacts, by role modeling or creating practices and teaching them to others, and creating structured environments for learning so that the scaffolding supports the development in a regenerative direction. And this is what cultural scaffolding theory teaches us, is that these are the key pieces or the design elements for how to structure the supports that people need. And we're gonna explore this with some examples related to regeneration in a few minutes. But first, just think about something like green consumerism. You know, the idea that if you only made different consumer choices, that the world would become more green and environmental. So change your light bulbs and the world is a better place. This completely ignores the larger structures that shape how individuals and societies develop with the passage of time. That's because all of us are embedded in larger systems and those systems create structural constraints as well as supports in some directions and barriers in other directions. Meaning that while you might make a small change within a system, you're very unlikely to change the system itself by looking in this atomized and reductionistic way. Instead, what you need to do is disentangle you from the, yourself from these embedded structures and then start to build the scaffolding to support your own development and the development of others. And that this is actually the way to transform a social system. So this is a really important thing for us to keep in mind as we look at examples like this one. An example of a scaffolded structure or an embedded system is the way that people need to pay rent because there's so much private property. So you might say to yourself, I want to live regeneratively, but somehow I have to pay rent on my apartment or house. So I have to work a job in a city, all of it dependent on fossil fuels or some other thing that you want to get away from because you have to pay rent. What you can see here is that society is actually scaffolded with support structures to require you to be complicit in extractive processes like mining for oil, or mining for minerals, destroying mountaintops to get those minerals and so on. And so this structure of private property and rent agreements scaffolds people's lives to be extractive. So you may do things like join a community um, garden and try to do things that are environmental, but the larger structures of your life are still embedded within an extractive system. Contrast this if with a situation where you have the supports where you might say, I really want to live regeneratively and there is land and community that can help me, where we have scaffolded supports for regeneration. So there might be really good advice and mentoring about how to live differently. Very good examples, case studies, demonstrations of how to live differently. And also to remove these barriers, like to create a community land trust where people don't need to pay rent or it lowers the cost of participation to live in these places where they become sites of learning and people can engage in regenerative practices together. Here, what we're talking about is changing the structures of our social environment so that it's easier to get away from extraction and also easier to live regeneratively. 
And this is something we've talked about a lot in the conversation about the Earth Regeneration Fund, but it's something that's also relevant in the specific way as it relates to cultural scaffolding. So when we look at the Earth Regeneration Fund that we talked about in a previous webinar, I had this slide that said that we need to learn how to work as a functioning group and then partner on projects. And as we do this, we create tools and frameworks so that we can cooperate with each other. Now, from the perspective of cultural scaffolding, what we're talking about here is creating mentoring, learning processes, collaborative conversations and dialogue, and collective projects, all of which make it easier to live regeneratively and easier to move away from extractive systems. So I'm explicitly designing the Earth Regeneration Fund with cultural scaffolding at the core of the design process. Similarly, the Earth Regenerator Study Group, which now has about 1,400 members, is an environment that is providing a lot of these social supports as well, when people connect with each other and learn. And in these webinars, we're also providing cultural scaffolding with shared knowledge, shared perspectives, and the Zoom calls that we have after the webinars. Like for this webinar, we'll have one on the following Monday, two days from now where we can engage in community dialogue about how to apply this knowledge to our own lives. And so what we're doing is intentionally introducing social supports to accelerate the adoption of regenerative practices within our own lives. And that this is cultural scaffolding explicitly built into the process. Now, I wanna make this personal for a moment by sharing the story of my own family. So here we are, this is me with my wife, Jessica, and our daughter, Elise, uh, on one of the last days when we were in Costa Rica last year. And I wanna share how it is that we came to the place that we're doing as much as we are to live regeneratively, and also give you a sense of how long and slow it's been to get here, so that you can see what happens in a life where there is not cultural scaffolding, a life of trying to do this without the support that's needed, and just how, how challenging it is. At the same time, you'll see in our story that we do have a lot of support along the way, but the support is too little and too small for us to make large transformational changes or to do it quickly. And so this indicates that even for us, we could benefit from more social support than we've had, or maybe we could benefit from different kinds of social support than we had, and that we wanna make those available to other people as we co-create in the Earth Regenerator Study Group. So let's tell, let me tell you our story for a moment. It starts back about 15 years ago in 2005, when my wife and I, it was before we were married, we left all of our friends and all of our family and moved away from Illinois, where we lived at the time, to live about 18 miles outside of town in Prescott, Arizona. The thing I wanna share here is that we left everything that was familiar to us and went to a place where we didn't have any friends. It was really lonely and it was a really difficult place to be. But it allowed us to separate ourselves from the extractive systems that we were a part of, at least from the point of view of reflecting and thinking. We had a lot of time to do hiking, did our first bike tour, started to really read and think deeply about how to live out our values. And by creating this separation from our old lives, we lost a lot of social support, but we gained the freedom to make choices in, an, uh, in a less constrained manner. But we were only able to do this by vastly simplifying our lives. We lived on a total of $5,000 for an entire year, which in the United States is well below the poverty level. And so we, we barely paid our rent. We were living extremely cheaply. And we were living outside of town in a cabin in the desert where we had a lot of time to think, but very few deep conversations with others and as we changed ourselves, it became harder to relate to our friends and family from before, creating a lot of obstacles and social challenges later on. So 15 years ago, we began this journey of how to live out our values by removing cultural scaffolding and isolating ourselves. From there, it took us five additional years until 2010 before we were able to stop owning a car because in the United States, most of the support infrastructure is built around transportation systems that require people to have a car. When you live in the country, you have to have a car to get to work or to go to the store, for example. Or if you live in the suburbs, you need to be able to commute to work. And in the US, there's very bad public 
transportation systems in most places. So it wasn't until we moved to Seattle that we were finally able to park our car, not drive it for a year, use public transportation and get around on bicycle, and then we were able to sell our car and still live with a functional life in the absence of an automobile. Now this saved us a lot of money because having a car is expensive. It saved us about $3,000 a year in maintenance expenses for the car alone. So we saved a lot of money. We began to definancialize our lives, but we did this by living in a very expensive city where we still needed to both work full-time jobs just to pay rent and live simply. So while we didn't have the expenses of a car, we began to have needs like a house costing $3,000 a month to rent and needing to find roommates and other things to make it affordable to live. So we were building a scaffolding using the leveraging of public transportation to get rid of our car. But in doing so, we added to our lives the, the cost of living in an expensive city. So there were trade-offs that moved us forward and moved us backward, both at the same time. But we also found a lot of like-minded people in Seattle and had more social support. And this did really help us to continue. But then in 2017, when our daughter Elise was born, we knew that we couldn't afford to live in Seattle anymore and that it wasn't a good place to raise a child. So our next move was to go to Eugene, Oregon, which is a place we had lived before and it's actually where we lived when we got married. But the reason we did this was because Eugene is a smaller city, was still a place we could get around by bike without needing to have a car. But there were a lot more community supports and it was much more conducive to raising a child. Also, the cost of living was lower, so we could get by living pretty well with less money, so we could work a little less and still have time to raise our daughter and try to live our values as parents. So it's a less expensive world. Yes, Elise. I'm, I'm, giving a car, I'm giving a webinar right now, sweetie. What do you want to tell me? I'm a snake. You're a snake? Oh, I like you as a snake. Do you want to go show mama how you can be a snake? Yeah? And is that your snake? my tongue. I like your tongue. And as you can see here with my with Elise coming to participate in my webinar, that it's really important that we made the space to have flexibility to be full-time parents, which we've been doing for three and a half years now since our daughter was born. But the trade-off here was that living in Eugene, we were still living in a town built by the lumber industry with a lot of consumeristic and militaristic culture, a lot of people with drug problems and uh, PTSD, a lot of stress and anxiety, among our friends and family, or at least our friends that lived in that area, our housemates. And we lived in a place where all of the struggles of being a working class poor person in the United States, just 80% of the US population, was creating a lot of stress for us. And we tried to protect our daughter from that consumeristic world as much as we could, but we were still buffering against the energy and tide of the larger culture because we couldn't escape it. So trying to live regeneratively still required us to step away from all of the social supports that were normally available to people living in the mainstream consumer lifestyle. In 2018, a little less than two years ago, we were invited to go live at an off-grid eco hotel and regenerative farm that is in the tropical rainforest in Costa Rica. And this was a work trade where we didn't have to pay for rent or for food in exchange for me giving webinars at this hotel so that we dramatically reduced our cost of living. But we went into social isolation and living at a place that's effectively a hotel meant that there were no children around. There was only one child in the neighboring Pueblo, a little village of 400 people that about one time a week, our daughter could play with another child. And there were a lot of structural problems trying to be a family with a child living in a hotel where they need to maintain a specific kind of professional environment for their guests. So we found ourselves really lacking social supports, but at the same time, much more liberated financially because we didn't need to earn money to live. We were able to live very simply. And that we spent a lot of this time for about 10 months learning as much as we could about regeneration and incorporating it into our lives. So again, we were living in the absence of social supports, but having a few more than we'd had before and actually having a very special financial arrangement of having effectively zero co um, cost of living so that we could do this for a 10 month period of time, which most people don't get that opportunity. 
So we were extremely lucky to have that position. And since we didn't have the social supports, eventually we felt we needed to leave. And that led us to moving to Columbia, which we did in November of 2019, a little more than six months ago. And now we're actually becoming part of a regenerative community centered around children and families with a community food forest. And while we have not fully moved away from the extractive economy, we're much further into regeneration than we were before. And so to kind of wrap up this part of the, this part of the webinar, I want to say that it's taken us 15 years so far. We're not done yet. We've had a lot of financial struggle and we've had to find creative ways to live regeneratively in the absence of social and financial supports. And we've spent a lot of time being separate from friends and family and having them not really be able to understand us or help us um, or support us as we were going through all of this. And because no one else had lived the way we were trying to live, at least no one that we knew as we were moving along, we just kept making it up as we would go, figuring out things through trial and error. And another thing I wanna stress that's really important, especially with what's happening in the US right now, is that with all of this struggle and hardship, we actually had a lot of things going for us that many people don't. We were born into privilege as white descendants of a colonial empire. And so it's been much easier for us to afford to make these moves, to have a passport from the United States that allows us to travel to different countries and other kinds of structural benefit that we have leveraged and have been privileges for us. So if it's been this difficult for us with so much privilege, you can imagine how much harder it is for say, an African American or people from other, uh, say more disenfranchised and more oppressed groups than we are. And so this need for social support is absolutely huge. Because if we didn't have it when we have so much going for us, imagine how much harder it is for most people in the world or most people who would want to live this way to be able to do it. So the lesson here is that this need for cultural scaffolding is both central to our work in earth regeneration and it's largely unacknowledged. Most people talk about regeneration by funding projects, creating agroforestry, demonstrating their businesses, and all of that relates to cultural scaffolding, but it's one step removed. Instead, we need to get clear on what is cultural scaffolding, how does it work, and specifically what kinds of social support are needed. Because as you can see in this graphic that I made for a blog post about four years ago, that we're at the time where we need to have a spread of best practices in regeneration over the next decade so that we transform our societal institutions all over the world, or as they collapse, we replace them. And so we need to build this cult cultural scaffolding as quickly as we can and be very, very strategic about doing it. And I've learned a lot about how we have been doing it and about what I think is needed. And this slide just summarizes a couple of insights. First of all, we really need to focus on social support. How do we help each other to live regeneratively? Partly this means we need to create models of cooperation so that we can work together, live together, financially support each other, or definancialize our lives through exchange patterns that allow us to get by without needing as much money, and actively mentoring each other as we go. I see this as having three key levels that we're dealing with in the Earth Regenerator Study Group. One is the storytelling layer, just sort of the foundation. How do we find each other to both give and receive social support? Well, we do that by the stories that we live, the stories that we tell, and the stories that are told about us so that we can use these as pathways to align around values, identity, and purpose. And there's a lot of need for storytelling specifically in this way. We also need to create what I call bridges for transition, which is these cultural supports of cooperative ownership models, um, education programs, learning sites, et cetera, that make it easier to take some of these steps more quickly. And that we need to organize these bridges for transition at the bioregional scale so that they can start to become more integrated and that they can leverage one piece into another to help accelerate the process of creating these scaffoldings around key land regeneration projects. So if we're working on restoring a forest, protecting a watershed, protecting a coastal estuary, or some geographic boundary of ecological and social function, that this way of organizing itself is a form of cultural scaffolding. 
So I see these as all being key pieces of the cultural scaffolding process. Now, I wanna talk about how to practice this with um, regenerative economics, but before I do that, just wanna be sure that people are, okay, it looks like people are able to see what's going on. Um, so uh, that's good, I'll continue then. <laughs> I just wanted to stop and look for a moment and then go back to the presentation. I'm glad to see that the, it seems the connection is working, so I'll continue. What I wanna do now is practice talking about cultural scaffolding using the framework of regenerative economics developed by John Fullerton and the Capital Institute, which is that they've identified eight key principles of regenerative economics that we can use to imagine how to support each other while we build these regenerative models. So these eight principles, being in right relationship, seeking balance, creating robust circulation, and so on. You can see them listed here. Let's go through them and see how do they apply to our relationships with each other. For example, if a regenerative economy is in right relationship, which is one of these principles, and it also seeks balance between its different elements, which is another principle, then we can look at how wealth inequality is a huge problem and also a huge opportunity. Because if there are some people who have more money than others, or if some people own land and others can't afford it, then they can seek right relationship and seek balance by sharing what they have. Those with more can leverage what they have to support those with less. Now, this is largely what philanthropy and a lot of the nonprofit world is actually about. So this isn't a new idea. What's different here is the specific social relationships. Like there might be someone who has enough money to buy a piece of land, but doesn't want to go and live there by themselves. They'd like to live in a community. So if they can find other people who would want to move to that land with them, then those with money can support those without. And maybe those who don't have money have something else to share. Like they can, um, maybe they know regenerative practices. They're trained in permaculture and they can lead the project and educate the person with the money or other kinds of exchange relationships. But you can see how the social supports can, be, can leverage inequality into a condition of right relationship ethically and pragmatically by seeking balance between the people involved. And that there are a lot of very concrete ways that we can imagine this being done. And I'd love to talk about this during the discussion portion of the webinar. Another way to think about this is regenerative economics. They, it views wealth in a holistic way and it creates edge effect abundance, which is when there are boundaries between the different elements of the system or the different domains of the system that they actually form synergies with each other. And I'd like to use the example of the land as a bank that we've talked about in the Earth Regeneration Fund to show how this works. That if we view wealth holistically, then something like water retention, biodiversity, health of soils, the amount of trust and the relationships between people living in a community, all of these things are part of the wealth and the health and well being of the community. So, if wealth is viewed holistically, then you can create a system of exchange around holistic wealth patterns. When you start to do that, those relationships create edges to each other where synergies can merge. So, if you have people who are building water retention systems or doing composting to build soils, those people can also train others or help grow food or um, be given affordable housing. And those who have more money can leverage their money into supporting these kinds of activities. And so you can see that the flow of exchange and energy by viewing wealth holistically allows for these relationships to become synergistic across the whole system, which is related to what I talked about for, before about being in right relationship. This is just another way to think about it is that if we can start to build structures and patterns of collaboration that are more holistic, then we will find ways to support each other that we wouldn't have known how to think about or how to actualize in the absence of those models. Another thing is that a regenerative economy has robust circulation and that it creates empowered participation for its members. One way to think about this is with circular economics and what are called solidarity networks or networks of mutual aid. So here we have a group of people coming together to all plant food in a community space. So there's robust circulation if those people who come to help then benefit in some way. 
So maybe they're able to take soil back from the composting project that you can see in the background. Maybe later they're gonna to get to eat some of this food without having to pay for it. But either way, they're helping to make decisions and they're taking actions that are directed by themselves. So they feel empowered to participate in co-creating these community projects. And there's a lot of flow of value and flow of well-being between the people involved. So we can imagine that using pro regenerative projects and learning sites, or by having cooperative models of ownership with regenerative practices on top of the land, can create these circulation patterns and these patterns of participation for the people, which then allows us to help each other and bring more people into regenerative living. Also, a regenerative economy is adaptive, innovative, and responsive at finding ways to help each other grow. So what this means is that we create the pro-social, the cooperative, generous, altruistic, supportive environments where people have emotional health and well-being so that they can work well in teams, so that they can improvise and solve problems under times of uncertainty. And by doing this, they adapt to changes. They're able to create innovative and clever, clever solutions, and they're able to respond to challenges as they arise. So this cultural capacity of emotional and social learning is a key part of how to build these community structures. So you can see the role of something like therapy and emotional support, grieving circles, education, uh, the social and emotional development of children, conflict resolution, um, and other things, peace building exercises, all of these will help to increase the regeneration of the community. Oh, Elise, I see the bottle. Wow, me gusta mucho. Estas van a ser el muerto, que bueno. My daughter and one of her friends are going to help make lunch today, showing that we have a lot of social support where we are, um, which is a beautiful example of, of how we're living in this way. So another example here is that our regenerative economy honors community in place. Yeah, niñas. Les veo, les veo. Que bonito. Muchas gracias para este. Muchas gracias. They really wanted to be sure I see what they were doing. So I wanted to take a moment and acknowledge that. So here we see that a regenerative economy honors community in place. And there are several ways to think about this. I'm giving three examples with the picture here. One is that one way we honor community in place is by taking care of our elders or raising our children well. Another is the non-human part. Ah, oh, sí, te veo, Elise. Muchas gracias. Te veo en particular. Y tú también soy. Tú también. Tú también. And you can see that I'm honoring community in place right now by being sure these two little girls are acknowledged by what they want to share with me. Um, so the reason I put the picture of this fish, which is a salmon, is that there are parts of the world where key animals or plants are indicators of health and well-being and are foundational pillars of the culture. All of the First Nation cultures of the Pacific Northwest and North America have built their lives around salmon. So if you're honoring community and place, you honor the non-human elements of the ecology as well as the human elements. And then, of course, how we heal and regenerate landscapes, like this water retention project that's depicted in the pictures at the bottom. All of these are aspects of how we can support each other. So we might have someone who protects the fish, and we can find ways to give them safe livelihoods for them to do that. Or we might do things like um, come together and build water retention projects. And as we collaborate in these projects and learn, to learn together, we're also honoring the places where we live and building the community and recognizing the community that's already there all at the same time. So we can see, you know, to sort of summarize what we've talked about throughout the webinar, that why it's been so difficult to live regeneratively has to be, has to do with this structural theory of cultural evolution, which is that most of us have cultural scaffolding that pulls us into extractive systems. And we have the absence or even a kind of animosity or hostility against living regeneratively where we don't have the so social supports that we need. The key clarity for us is that as we learn how to live regeneratively, we ourselves become cultural scaffolding for others. So we need to help each other learn how to live regeneratively to do this well. And we did this just a moment ago, 
by sharing the story of my own family and looking at regenerative economics as a framework of concepts. So the key takeaway here is that we are actually the scaffolding for each other. And this is the secret for regenerating the earth. This is something that doesn't get talked about nearly enough. The way we learn how to regenerate the earth is we learn how to get the support that we need and to provide the support for others. So just as my wife and I have been on a 15 year journey where we've learned a lot about what does and doesn't work about living regeneratively, we're trying to share that with as many people as we can to provide scaffolding for them. But also all of the regenerative projects, permaculture camps, eco-villages, transition towns, and so on. All of these are attempts to create scaffolding to help each other. But now we need to be very explicit. What supports do I need? What supports can I provide? And what relationships help to create this balance and circulatory flow of being alive together so that all of us can be regenerative in more empowering and impactful ways? And that's what I'd love to talk with all of you about now for the rest of the, the session. And so um, I hope that the technology and the, the, um, the connection was good enough during this part of the, the presentation part of the discussion. And I'm very interested in starting to have a conversation with all of you. So if anyone has a question or a topic you'd like to discuss, please pose it by asking a question at the bottom of the screen. Also vote for the questions that have already been posed so that you can